testing, okay. Okay, I think it's time to begin. Um, do the mandatory audio check. Can people hear me? Anyone can hear me? Yep, okay. At least one person can hear me. Um, so there are a few things I want to talk about before we go into lecturing. Um, so the first topic is that as you have probably noticed, the registration for the fall semester starts today. Um, some of you will register later. And there are a few things later that I'm going to talk about. Um, <clears throat> first is that um, you've probably noticed that pretty much businesses are shut down, we're all sitting at home. I'm not going anywhere, not spending money. Um, as a consequence, a lot of people are out of work or not working very much. And so the state of California anticipates a major budget problem. Um, so San Diego State is trying to anticipate some of that. And so they've asked the department to try to actually all departments identify all um, courses which might have a low enrollment. So, and they've also asked us to then take those courses offline until we have a better idea of what's going on. Um, the university also anticipates that enrollments will be down next year. Um, in part because the number of students who um, were depending upon jobs, either because they're from the parents' viewpoint or their viewpoint, um, don't have those jobs anymore or might not have those jobs in the near future. And so some students may decide to postpone coming to school. Um, for the computer science department, um, a lot of our students are from India and in a typical year, we get about 80 new graduate students in the fall, and 20 to 30 of them are from this country, and the rest are basically from India. It's not clear if those students 
and remitted for the fall will be able to attend in the fall. Um, I guess embassies are processing visas. It's not clear when they will start. And it's not clear um, when um, people will be allowed to travel from India to the United States. Um, which means that enrollments in computer science classes could be down in the fall. And for those of you who are from India, if you got friends who have applied, um, San Diego State is allowing uh, new graduate students to postpone attending um, class until the spring semester, but they have to contact a graduate advisor to do so. Um, they also asked me not to do a general broadcast to students admitted in India to tell them that. Um, I like that idea, but that's their decision. Um, so the number of classes that either have disappeared from the schedule for the fall or don't have any schedule numbers. Um, there are a couple of courses where we don't have instructors yet. And given the budget situation, we don't know if um, we'll be able to pay instructors if we can find them. So rather, rather than have students enroll in those courses and then later we cancel them, the university wants us to keep them, um, keep students from enrolling in them until we have a better picture of what's going on. Any questions about that? Uh, we have um, also related to the fall semester. Um, we will be running courses through our College of Ten Studies, or as we like to be called now, the World Campus. Um, yeah, so the question about formal languages, um, those are one of the courses involved. Typically, it does not have a large enrollment. Um, so, so that is one of the courses that's been hidden. And at this point in time, we just don't know. And even, we don't even know when we will know. Um, it all depends upon a number of factors. One is how many, what's our budget going to be like next next year? Um, typically, we know, have a good idea in May, um, but this year is anything but typical. Um, so at this point, yes, we don't know if it's going to be offered in the fall, and we also don't know when we will know. In terms of college and studies courses, um, those courses are different than regular courses in that they're self-supporting. The college and studies does not receive any um, funds from the state. So all expenses for those courses have to be paid by the tuition students um, pay. Um, in the fall, I typically teach a course on iOS development. Uh, the enrollment in that class has been a little bit thin the last couple of years. So instead of offering that course in the fall, um, we're going to be offering a course, well, I'll be teaching a course on cross platform mobile and development. Um, and we'll see if that attracts more people or not. And let's see, um, the last thing about class schedules, the spring schedule is online. Um, if you look at that schedule, you won't see me listed. Um, and, and that's because the course I'm planning on teaching in the regular university in the fall is going to be a new course. Um, and we're waiting for the approval, for that course to be approved. 
It has been approved as a 596, but this should be close to getting approval as a regular course. And we, this I would prefer to have it listed under the regular course schedule. Um, so any questions about fall or spring class schedules? So can you repeat that again? Were you, when were you going to teach this class again, if ever? Um, so that, so next spring, um, I'm planning on teaching a course on data science. Um, my original plan was to alternate between um, big data and, and data science alternately in, in the spring. Um, my preference would be to teach the data science course in the fall and then big data in the spring, but there are other courses I'm teaching. So um, currently the plan is to alternate the two in the spring, but we have to, have to realize that um, COVID-9 has changed everything um, and so we'll see what, what impact it has in terms of budgets and teaching schedules. Any other questions? All right, thank you, sir. Um, next topic. Um, Rest of, this rest of the semester for this course. Um, typically what I do in this course, um, once people get started on their projects, um, it's not clear how much they're listening to me. So usually the last week or two, I stop lecturing and just have class period for office hours. Um, I'm actually ahead of where I normally am in this course. And so I spent all weekend preparing new material for, on Cassandra. Um, I also want to talk about Tableau. Um, it shouldn't take too long. Uh, and I'm also thinking about talking about um, service architectures uh, for a little bit. And after that, I'll probably just um, let class turn into office hours. I am planning um, one small assignment. Um, the assignment will probably take, um, take the names, data set you created, and run it on AWS to create the decision tree. Just to give you an experience, um, running Spark in a cluster environment. Um, you know, I, one of the difficulties of teaching remotely like this is that we get less feedback. Um, you know, you walk into class and you see people half asleep because they were up all night. You get to notice, I mean, that tells you that uh, students are probably working way too hard. Um, so it becomes hard to judge what's going on. Um, particularly since students are usually reluctant to um, give feedback in terms of, well, they don't understand material or they're behind um, human nature. Um, but we'll see. Um, so next topic, um, there's been some questions about the exam. Um, and First thing I want to say is talk about what's a model, right? A model is just a function. Um, 
right? when you think about linear regression, linear regression, particularly with one independent variable, is this is this a linear line? Um, and when you create that function, right, that is the model. So when you lose linear regression, it produces a function, and that's it. Um, so we don't need to create, um, you know, a formal model through SkyKit-Learner to actually have a model. The second thing you want to say is, you know, there's a big difference between reading about a subject, listening to people's lecture, and actually doing it. Um, and there are a couple of reasons why. One is it's just a different type of activity. And I assume everyone's had the um, experience like I have. You go to class, you know, the instructor, you know, shows you how to do something. You go, yeah, yeah, that, that looks, that, yeah, I got it, I got it, I got it. And then they give you an assignment and you sit down with the assignment and you're like, uh, now what do I do? All right? Um, that panic moment, like, I, I wasn't a lecturer, I read the material, but now I have to do it. It's like, where do I start? I don't have a start. Um, and the second thing is, uh, when we're dealing with computer computing, um, we call it computer science, but there's a lot of, I think of it more as engineering. Um, so when you start doing things, you start saying, oh, wait, what about this issue? What about that? I didn't think about that when we're reading about it. So for example, you know, some students have, have finally realized that when we've got categorical data, like male and female and names, um, what happens if I take my data set and I can break it into a training set and a test set, what happens when there's a name that's in my test set which somehow didn't happen to be in my training training set? Right, and this is a problem when you've got categorical data, right? It doesn't. Um, if your data set, your training set doesn't contain those names, then um, how can the model respond? So there was a question that popped up about the data science course it will be a 500 level course that was determined not by me, but by the department. And that's one of the reasons why um, it's not being taught in the, in the fall because um, at the time the fall schedule was being made, um, we had we didn't have enough sixth level courses, and so changing my um, sixth level. Yes, the model can say not available. Um, So back to my train of thought. So um, for me, yeah, until you do something and start seeing what the issues are for real, um, I really don't think I, I know the material. Right? I really think that I have to do it, um, find out these little gotchas that come up before I understand um, what's going on.
Okay, so question, yes, next topic. Um, about the projects. Um, first issue is people have asked is how big does your data set have to be? I'm less concerned about the data size of the data set and more concerned about what um, what you do with the data set. Right. Um, if you look at the assignments we've had so far, um, only one assignment had a really big, relatively large data set. Um, your exam data sets are pretty small. So it's more important to um, what you're doing to the data set as opposed to um, how big the data set is. What do I expect you to do on Thursday? Um, like I said, no formal presentation. It's like, okay, I found this data set um, and on FUBAR and I'm going to use it, you know, I'm going to use it to com compare and contrast um, decision trees with clustering as a method of classification, right? Or what I plan on doing is I plan on um, creating a, a standard cluster and I'm going to populate with data and then I'm going to connect it um, using Kafka to spit, to take data out of it and put it into Spark. All right. So your know, project could be analyzing data, which is most of what we talked about. Um, it is possible for someone to just do create a pipeline of data coming from a database through Kafka into Spark. Um, you know, people can also do things like, you know, compare and contrast the performance of, you know, say Spark versus um, Dask on a data set. So on Thursday, it's just, yeah, just a very informal um, description of, you know, what type of data that you're thinking about doing, what are you planning on doing with it? Does that answer the question about what's happening on Thursday? So the question is, um, how long a presentation? Um, a few minutes, probably five at most. Um, I don't expect it to be very long, um, in part because we have um, a large number of students to, to um, go through. Um, I have a question about um, that question. Um, are we going to be presenting our projects like on Zoom to the class? No. Um, we're not presenting project, your project to class. It's like um, in Zoom, you'll talk about for five minutes what you plan on doing for your project. Okay. So we're not actually like once we do everything with our project, we're not actually going to like bring it back to the class. No, um, that's always something I like to do, but um, given the number of people in the class and how busy people are during finals week, it's just not 
reasonable. Okay, so are we supposed to do like a like a paper then? Um, well, like your assignments, you will then produce more likely a um, Jupyter notebook. Okay. And then what you'll end up doing is you have to do a bit more explaining what's going on because on the assignments, everyone's doing the same thing. So I know exactly what problem three means. Um, so on your, on your project, you'll have to say, look, here's, you know, my goal of this project is gonna be this. Um, here's where I found the data sets. Um, here's what I've done, here's the results, Here, and I explain the results. Um, can you work in a group? Um, yes, I do a lot groups of two. Um, I don't like groups larger than that because it becomes hard to know who did what. Um, and given that we're all sitting at home, it also becomes harder to um, get together and work on the project. Um, Uh, which technology you're supposed to use? Um, I don't expect you to use all of them. Um, in the past, most students have used just um, Spark, but it, it varies quite a bit. Um, so I don't expect everyone to use um, Every technology doesn't I mean it's too much work and doesn't make sense in many cases. Is there something on the website about the final projects? Um, it is described in the syllabus. Um, Can you describe the level of complexity? Um, that can be somewhat difficult. Um, you know, I expected these more complex in your exam. Um, one of the motivations for having you talk about the project is um, so that they can, you give some feedback on whether the project is um, too small, too big, um, too complex, too simple. Any other questions? Uh, professor? Yes. I have a question about the uh, exam. Okay. I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a more of a general question, but while working on the exam, it got me thinking about it. So, uh, for example, when we are trying to solve a problem using the pandas data frame and we are collecting a data frame in a variable, for example, if, I'm, if I have a data frame for deaths rate and right. uh, I'm performing some computation on it, for example, I'm dropping some columns on it. So, uh, what are the advan advantages of using the same variable name, like death rate is equal to death rate, then drop columns? Would, am I doing my memory any favors by using the same variable name again and again for some kind of computation? Um, well, th there's two issues there. One, if, if you're just using the same variable name um, and assigning a different data frame, um, The effect it has on memory is that if that variable is the only one pointing to the old data frame, then that old data frame can be garbage collected. Um, now, if you're, if you're assigning it, 
you can modify your existing data frame to have new columns. That's a different story. And also, also I was thinking if we need to go back to the original data frame for doing some other computation, then it might be a problem because it's already lost. Right, then you have to recreate it, yes. Yeah. So it depends on the context on like what I'm doing with it. Right, and the other thing you have to think about when you start doing that is reusing the same name um, for different things um, can be at times misleading because now um, well, I mean, they're, they're slightly different things, right? And so using the same name, and so at some point, people might be confused. So, does Fu represent A or does it represent B now? Right, yeah. Yeah, gotcha, thank you. Mm -hmm. So let's see, there was a question here. Um, yeah, so the, the part two, question two on the names, um, the function is pretty simple. Um, There are times when names have changed, um, whether you know, some names are used for both sexes and some names have modified a little bit um, over time. I know when I was in high school, there was this um, sort of embarrassing moment where we had gym class and the the boys and men and the women's cl classes met at the same time in the same place. And the first day of class, you started men and bleachers on one side, women on the other side, and the instructor for the men was reading out names for people in the class, and the women instructor for the women's class was reading out names. And at one point, she kept on calling out the same name, and eventually some one of the boys said, here. Um, Um, yeah, the question is, can I post previous projects? No, I would have to get approval from the student first. Um, I can look back and see, what, see some of the things I've done, but I can't actually post the actual project. Any other questions? Oh yeah, Kegel has lots of data sets. Uh, has lots of data sets. Um, there are data sets appearing all the time now related to COVID-19. Um, and I came across, um, a good analysis a couple of days ago, um, trying to compute a, a time dependent um, rate of infection for COVID-19 in different locations. Um, I thought about posting that to the class, but I suspect only one person in the class has a background to understand what's going on there, so I didn't. Yeah, Kegel is a good place to look for data sets and UC, uh, UC Irvine also has a repository of, of data sets. Yeah. 
if there are no more questions, um, Let's see. Well, there's a question about, again, question two. Um, is it okay if you don't include the year column? There is one little gotcha on question two that no one's brought up yet. Um, so you need to think about that, whether you want your columns or not. And why, why not? Instructions, what do you mean by instructions? Um, I don't have written instructions, but we did just talk about little what I expect. And I expect you to come with data set to analyze. Um, and then you'll produce a, you know, a different notebook explaining, again, what the goal of your project is, um, you know, where you got the data set, information about the data set, um, what you did to achieve your goal. Um, Right, and the results. And now a couple of things on, one thing on results. Um, invariably, um, someone will pick a data set and say, here's what I want to do. Um, you know, someone might say, okay, what I want to do is I want to do look at all the basketball data in the NBA so I can predict who's going to win the championship um, each year. And make lots of money and they do all this analysis and they find out that they, they really can't predict, right? The predictions are bad. And they get all bummed out and think they're a failure. Um, but that's not the case, right? It's um, negative results are still results. And actually there's a big problem in science in that um, publications don't like, tend not to publish negative results, um, but it's very useful to know what things have been tried and have not worked. Um, that's information too. And there was one other thing. Uh, just escaped my mind. And it'll come to me later. Um, Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, there's a reason I um, now try and have projects in classes, and I'm also, I want students to come up with their own project. Um, I've spent, uh, you know, some time on sabbatical at the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana. And if you don't know that school, um, a lot of companies have come out of that school. Um, YouTube was started, was started by students in Regent Champaign-Urbana. The first um, web browser was started by a student at Champaign-Urbana as a project. Um, and when you go there, about half the computer science students belong to um, the student chapter of the ACM. 
and they get together in the fall and there's this big huge meeting a big auditorium and they announce there's like 15 different subgroups pick your group um, those groups then go on to you know create a project year-long project and then in the middle of spring semester there's a big event where all the teams in engineering school have displays and when you go to class at champion urbana illinois they um every class except the very first freshman year um, of computer science all the undergraduate all the other undergraduate courses and every graduate course um, the first day of class the instructor walks in and says okay this is you know, we're talking about data structures, and you know, here's a book. We're gonna have so many assignments and be created this way, blah blah blah. And you're gonna have a project, All right? Every course um, there um, has requires a project after you've got out of the, fr the freshman year of computer science. Every computer science course, right? From then on, and you notice that, oh, what happens is now students have to think about what's important about that subject, what's interested them, and come up with their own ideas. Um, and, and that's why um, you start seeing a lot of companies um, being formed by students in Champion Urbana because they're, they're like rally, they spent their entire career, every course, every semester, they have to think of some project to do, right? Um, and I realized, you know, what we do at San Diego State is like, well, go do this, go do that, go do that. Um, and you never have to ask questions like, well, what's, what's interesting in this subject? What's, what, what do I want to do? What, what makes, what interests me? What are the interesting questions? What are the important questions? Um, And so after I got back from you know spending a year there, it's like, well, I guess it's a lot harder to deal with projects, but um, I think our students have to be exposed to this idea of um, learning is not just instructors telling you all this information and you're trying to memorize it on exams and doing exactly what um, we ask you to do in assignments. Okay. So I think um, we have a half hour to go. Um, Let me share my screen. Okay. Now, so last time we were talking about doing streaming um spark and now uh, i've got three screens in front of me so i sometimes my cursor gets lost um oh great now 
There's definitely a chat window and Okay. Every time I make a change, Zoom hides my chat window and the people listen to class. So last time we're talking about, again, Spark streaming. Um, and so we're talking about Kafka streaming data into Spark. Um, and Right, and so we have this program where, um, you know, the, the important part here is, right, the input this part is coming not from a file, but from a Kafka stream. And then, you know, where we're connecting to the Kafka, um, right. And also I want to point out um, feedback, like I said, is, is useful. Um, so, you know, a couple of lectures ago, Brianna said, oh, what lecture, what slide am I on? So now you'll find down here, um, you know, something is, for some reason things are slowing down. Um, let me just check one thing. Yeah, no, it should be okay. This is the document I'm doing on, and now I have over on the other side, right? Um, the slide number to help you find out what's going on. Right, and so we're talking about inputting into um, Spark data from the Kafka stream. And we talked about, um, it comes in batches. Okay, I'll have to go slower for some reason, I'm getting a delay. Um, Now, the last thing I want to talk about is windows. Um, the, so the problem is, if we're streaming this data in and we do this continuously um, for days and days or weeks and weeks or months and months, right, we're going to build this huge set of data and um, it may be we're only interested in, and I want to know, you know, what's happened in the last hour. Right, the last day. Um, and the data set contains all the data from the previous six months. Um, you know, the current data for the last hour is going to get lost. And so we can use Windows where we're now only interested in, we're going to produce a data set for all events that occurred in this particular window of time. Um, all right, um, and so we want something well, very interesting. Um, so we want um, the timestamp and Right, this window is a time interval we're interested in data being grouped by. Um, and then when we reach the end of that window, what do we do? Well, we, we slide that window forward a fixed amount and then compute another data set for that new window frame. Um, so here what's happening is um, you know, our window, our slide duration is two seconds. So we're going to slide it forward two seconds. Um, and our window is going to be five seconds long. Um, and now 
um, our group Y contains you know, a window duration and a slide duration. So we're going to get different, for each window, we'll get a different data frame. Um, and then we're going to slide, when we reach the end of that window, we're going to slide it forward and get another data frame for, for all the events that occurred in that time frame. Make sense? So here's an example. Um, so again, we have this. In this case, right, a window is going to be 10 minutes long and you're going to slide it five minutes. Um, right, so 10 minutes. Um, now, first we have input. Now I need the, the machine catch up. I guess perhaps I shouldn't have a Jupyter notebook running and Cassandra running um, at the same time. We'll do lectures. And, all right. You know, so five minutes later, we get this data set. Um, and then, you know, 1207. Um, And input some more data. So now at 10, 12, 10, we're getting two separate data frames. Um, right, one for the 12 to 10 o'clock, you know, 12, 10. Um, and then one data frame for the next window frame, like the 12, 05 to 12, 15. All right, and then some more data gets entered at different times. All right. Um, and so now we're getting all right, three separate all right, data frames because now we're looking at, again, the original 12 to 12, 10 version, the 1205 to 1215 version, and then the 1210 to 1202 version. Okay, any questions? Okay. Okay. Um, and so again, here's our program. Um, and here's the output we get, right? So batch one, um, you know, one set time frames, next batch two, we're getting right, the original set. And then we're getting, um, let's see, the original set, there's actually two batches here. 
and then we're getting you know, more back to data to the data set. One last thing to worry about is um, what happens when data um, arrives late. And you know, so here's an example where, again, right, this data is sent very early, um, but arrives late. Um, so what Spark will do is, since it didn't arrive in time for this first data frame to be um, Right, record it, so um, it doesn't record it. It didn't arrive in time for it to appear, right, in the second one, um, but it did appear, and now what happens is the Spark goes back and adds it to the original um, data frame. So that's um, and then we can specify how late data can arrive and still be used. And that is all I want to uh, um, basically say about Kafka streaming into uh, Spark. Any questions? Okay, so I want to start talking about um, Databases, um, in particular NoSQL databases. Now I assume that most people in the class have some exposure to SQL databases, whether it be taking a database course or doing MySQL or you know, Postgres, Oracle, and project. Um, you know, relational databases um, were first discussed in 1970 by you know, a paper by Yip Todd. Um, and that paper outlined all the normalization rules that people know about. Um, one thing of note is that the first commercial database um, is Oracle. Um, you know, Part because that Oracle is a very big company, um, charges an awful lot of money for the database. And, you know, basically we create tables and, and then have SQL to generate um, queries on the database so we get data out and put data in. 
Now, um, NoSQL, that, NoSQL databases have a long, long history. So, 1955, there was a NoSQL database. Well, basically, before 1970, it wasn't possible to have um, NoSQL databases, but SQL wasn't created yet. Um, it wasn't until you know, 1998 where um, the term was, was actually um, coined, NoSQL. Um, and you know, in the early 2000s, there were a lot of different um, NoSQL databases that came out and were used. Um, one big one is Google's big table, um, you know, that, and that paper came out to um, change a lot of things. Um, I want to look at a particular most of the database, Cassandra, and Cassandra comes out to Facebook, um, and they open sourced it. Um, 12 years ago. And 2009 was, was actually Eric Evans is the one that made NoSQL name popular, um, gave his current meaning. So, why do we need NoSQL databases? NoSQL databases with the tables. Um, become hard to scale across multiple machines. Um, you know, think about it. You know, if I've got a new SQL, if I got an SQL database and I've got tables, um, how do I take that database and put it in multiple machines? Well, one way is to replicate the data in all databases, in all, all machines, and then just do load balancing between machines. That allows your database to handle more users currently, more requests currently, but it doesn't help us um, when the data gets larger and larger. Um, and NoSQL databases are easier um, to scale the size of the data across um, many, many machines. Um, people say that the NoSQL databases are more flexible. Um, I don't know if any of you have had experience dealing with a big NoSQL database. Um, in the past, it was quite common that a company had a you know, database manager, and if you wanted to make any modifications to any, add some new table, create more tables, you had to submit your request to the database uh, manager and they would either accept or deny your request. Um, so it became even just, even organizationally, it became difficult to modify um, databases. Um, and there are some other advantages where it's sort of a pain to deal with. Um, yeah, yeah, there's lots of um, different databases that do I mean, a lot of them, right? Um, now, there's some disadvantage of using SQL databases, and the biggest one is that there is no SQL. Um, so, there's no standard interface to, to a NoSQL database. Um, some NoSQL databases give a SQL-like interface, um, but they don't, some do not, which means, well, if you switch from Oracle to using MySQL, um, both of the databases have their own extensions, um, but if you void those extensions, um, 
you know, then most USQL statements will work on both, right? Um, and another big one is no joins. Um, and you see that in Cassandra. Um, and most of them do not support, you know, the standard ACID um, that mission databases do. Um, and the big thing is um, consistency. And the reason is, if, well, if we start using a NOSQL database, we're going to have that database spanned across multiple machines. And as soon as we get multiple machines involved, um, the CAP theorem tells us that, you know, you know we can't have everything, right? Um, and so most of them um, relax consistency. And we'll see this in Cassandra. Cassandra actually allows us to specify um, how much consistency we want on each operation. So if we have an operation that's very important, we can say, well, you know, don't consider that operation done until all the machines have updated values. Or the next request, you say, well, as soon as one machine's got the data, I'm good. And then you can slowly propagate those values to the other machine. Um, people have tried to categorize NoSQL databases. Um, so here is, you know, some examples, of some categories. Um, the wide column category is probably misnamed. Um, Cassandra is an example, but the Cassandra protocol is a um, wide row. Um, so we'll see what that means later. Um, now here is um, some examples of different types of um, most of the databases, which is the category they're in, and different examples. Not I mean, there are plenty of examples which are not um, on this list. And for us, I think the big two are um, big table um, because of what Google has done with it. Cassandra borrows. Um, some key features from um, big table and another popular one at least in the spark world is hbase that does run on the spark environment um, so what do we mean by a document oriented um, database well, it has a key, and the key usually is to be a string, the identifier, the URL, or path. And at that key, we put a document. By document, usually it's either JSON or XML, right? So here is an example of a JSON document. Um, so in our database, we could say, okay, what we're going to do is, you know, we'll put in at the key Bob this particular um, document or basically JSON um, object. So that's all it means, right? If we um, you know, so one popular example of a document-oriented NoSQL database is Firebase from Google that many people use as a backend to a 
um, either a web page or a mobile application. The well, key value store is just what it says. Um, there's a key um, and you put a value there. So a document-oriented database. So the special case of a key value store um, where the values are documents. So an example of a um, key value um, database is Redis. And the, the keys are all strings. But you know, here's a list of all the things that um, would be values. So Redis is is more general than a document-oriented database because um, we can have we can put in strings, and a string could be a JSON document or a set of strings, list of strings. Um, and here is a simple Redis example. Um, in Python, where I'm importing the Redis uh, library, I'm connecting to you know, Redis host at a particular location. And then um, the basic operation is that this particular key, you know, write this particular value. Um, and then to get the value out, you just, you know, use a get. Right, so all of a sudden it becomes a lot simpler than SQL where you have to re need you know, SQL statements to do this. It's just set and get. Um, so Cassandra. Um, is a fairly popular NoSQL database in the big data world. Um, it's open source, so it's free. You can download it. Um, I currently have one on my laptop. It's distributed, so you can run it across multiple machines. Um, you can scale it you know, dynamically, add more machines. Um, and yeah, the, the data model they use comes from Google's Big Table. Um, and it borrows um, a number of architectural designs from Amazon's Dynamo system. And to give you an idea, um, Apple claims to have a 100,000 node Cassandra um, database. They announced this a few years ago at the Cassandra conference. They refused to tell anyone what they use it for, just typical Apple. Um, but that shows you that you can create a very, very large Cassandra um, database, many, many machines. Um, Netflix uses Cassandra as a back-end database for the streaming service. Um, and you can imagine worldwide Netflix gets a lot of traffic, particularly these days. Um, four years ago, Uber um, presented a paper at the Cassandra conference, and they claim they're able to get a million writes per second to the Cassandra database. Um, and the reason they needed that throughput is that worldwide, um, the driver apps, um, when they're active, updates the location every 30 seconds. And the writer app does the same thing. 
Um, as some of you may remember a few years ago, there was this outcry when people discovered that um, Uber app was recording the location even when they weren't um, asking for a ride. Um, but you get, you know, worldwide, that's a lot of data that's pouring in. Um, Dr. Sandra, um, can scale for very large databases. They can perform um, extremely well um, and lots of load. Okay, and any last questions or I quit for today? Yes, um, I am behind on my email. Um, and I hope to catch up this week. We're getting a number of emails about various changes, a number of emails from students from India. Um, um, what's the difference between Spark and Cassandra? Spark is a um, computation engine. Um, Cassandra is just a database. Cassandra doesn't do any computation, it just stores data and handles requests for data. Okay, we run out of time, so see people on Thursday. Um, how do you handle um, and request for data in, in um, yeah, so um, when we come back um, lecturing, um, I'll show you how we deal, how you handle requests. Okay, I will see people on Thursday. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you.